I'm Benoit Montreuil. I'm a professor here at Georgia Tech uh, in the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. I'm holding the Coca-Cola Chair in Material Learning and Distribution. And uh, from a leadership perspective, I've taken the, uh, uh, the co-directions of uh, the Supply Chain Logistics Institute with uh, my friend uh, Martin Salvesberg. And uh, I'm also directing the Physical Internet Center. So today what I've been asked is to make a presentation that would kind of uh, give an overview about the, the physical internet. And uh, it's kind of presentation that I, I don't do a lot now because at most time I, I'm trying to be more focused or advanced. Here I'm, I've gotten back to some of the slides that, that date a bit just to make sure that uh, I would cover everything. And I wanted to, have a cra to be able to deal with a crowd that'd be mixed between academia and industry. So it's kind of a mix. Uh, uh, in there and hopefully uh, as this will progress you'll get more and more understanding what what is the physical internet what we're trying to do what kind of research project is going on and what's happening in industry that that is lined up very uh, nicely with with what we're we've been working on uh, on, on this topic so first okay uh, when we're going to talk about the physical internet, there's, and I'm going to come back to this more and precisely, but the notion is that you, we all know the internet, and, and for me, when I'm telling the internet, I'm talking about the digital internet. So digital internet has completely transformed uh, the ICT uh, technology, the industry, and our industries, and so on, from a world where everything was private, dedicated, to a world where now we've got worldwide platforms completely open. And in many, many ways, we've got the clouds, we've got the mobile. So it's complete revolution. Uh, socially, we now have the social nets uh, and everything that goes around this. So big impact transformative but when I was young there was no internet there was no digital internet so the digital internet was a con Whoop. let me put this on sorry about this okay now do you hear me ah okay good sorry I've got two of them uh, whoop, sorry let's go back Okay, so basically, when I was young, there was no f no internet. There was a, we. The, it was only like a network from control. That even before that, we didn't even have networks. Everything was disconnected. So now we have uh, full full internet. So when we're dealing with the physical internet, it's basically try instead of moving the bytes, we're going to move real objects. Okay, the lunches that you have, the chairs that you're sitting on, your clothing, and, and etc. Okay, so that's that's where we're about, and we're and we try to take a very comprehensive view of it. So talking about moving the objects, deploying the objects, realizing the objects, so making them, assembling, personalizing, and so on, supplying them, so the buy sell relationship, providing function and the design of the objects, as well as the use of the object, how we use objects, uh, physical objects. So that's the overall scope that we're covering here uh, in there. So this is something that started uh, in uh, 2006, uh, and I'll explain how a bit earlier. And recently, like in 2014, Science Magazine made its first ever uh, issue on supply chain and logistics, and, and uh, the physical internet was highlighted as, a, as a, the key theme of, of the, the magazine. That's very interesting. Now, before, before I go into uh, explaining what it is, I want to get back a little bit and try to understand that there is challenge and there's need to take a comprehensive look. Otherwise, I'm just this professor that is idealistically trying to have fun, uh, ivory tower and dreaming, etc. And that's not at all the intent here. So basically, I've taken my six verbs uh, about physical objects and I've colored them as to impact on the specific liner that I'm talking about. So for example, uh, fill rates of transport means. You open the doors of a semi-trailer, of, of a rail car, and so on, or a container in many ways right now. 
and you look how much it's filled. Like uh, semi trailers, right now the average is about 50, 60 percent when you consider the, the, uh, uh, the volume and weight constraints. But this 50, 60 person assumes the cases, the packaging, the pallets as given. Okay? While this is not the case. In reality, when we go to the value-added products, we can go down all the way to lower than 10%. Okay? So it's bad. And empty travel, we've got a lot of people do research on routing uh, and, uh, and scheduling and all kind of uh, network design to try to avoid this, but it's still roughly in the average of 25%. I've got a lot of excess travel that we do that we would not have to do. So for example, you, you get something, uh, you're in France and you, you get something uh, from e-commerce uh, that comes from Alibaba or and it's put on FedEx, FedEx FedEx takes it by plane to America and from America will ship it in France. And in France, it's not going to come at the right uh, re region, so it have to then go, go somewhere else. That's all related to the way we do it now. Uh, break, break bulk and cross dock times and cost. There's a words in practice that says uh, minimize the touch. Okay, so every time you touch, okay, it's, it's devil, okay? You, so this is ways you want to do it. But the way I'm, we're trying to envision it is uh, we did the same with economic lot sizes with setup times in manufacturing many years ago. But then the Japanese said, listen, take your economic uh, uh, functions and then reduce the setup cost and you'll see what happens to your lot size. So we've got the same kind of logic here trying to say, can we get those times, those costs much smarter than, than this? And I'll show how we tackle it. Multimodal is something that we all dream about. There's some of it, but it's very limited as what we do versus what we could do. Even yesterday, I was reading that for a company in the region, if they go by truck versus by train, it's not the speed when it's moving the issue. It takes them two weeks to schedule something on the train. So two weeks what they aspire is that the product is already in the hands of the consumers, not waiting for a train. So this is kind of thing that uh, the people don't like. Uh, lean, uh, being greener, uh, having strong visibility, traceability, uh, worker, driver, quality of life. Uh, in most states in the United States, uh, the biggest employment is truck driving. And the turnover rate in the US is over 100 person a year. This is bad, okay? This is bad in all ways, okay? So can we get away from that and improve this? Uh, packaging material waste, okay? We waste so much packaging, okay? Whatever you get, okay, from e-commerce or wherever, look at everything you throw away and look at what you just purchase and you'll see there's a huge world of difference between these. Traffic and congestion, okay? Uh, in Atlanta now, I'm, I'm at a point where basically I've never seen that before, okay? You go in HOV if you're two in the vehicles. So, so this means that most people are alone and most vehicles are empty and, the, and the, our roads are filled, okay? And trucks, we got a lot of trucks going, uh, going along and when we know what's above there, then there's a lot of those trucks that we would not necessarily need to have or could, we could deal with them much better. Uh, production storage facility utilization that are oftentimes low or bad. It's oftentimes is uh, we have peaks in some some times, some re some seasons. So we have to design for peak, and for the rest of the year we're badly utilized. Or we fill it so we get it to work, but with stuff that should not be done here, it should be done elsewhere. So this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. We have still way too much inventory in the system, a lot of overproduction waste associated product availability, even though we think that, that because we have a lot of inventory, products should be highly available. That is completely false, okay? So you've, you always have the products that the people are not really asking, okay? So, so in many ways, when you, and, and you cannot just look that oh, there's a stock out or something complain, because most of the time the customers will not even see, but he, he just leaves or does something else. So th there's a lot of ways there. Delivery speed, precision, we have a lot of pressure right now, like companies like Amazon are, are really disrupting and 
on that level and telling, let's get it fast, okay? And so there's this speed aspect, but there's also this precision. So I wanted Saturday morning between nine and 11, okay? Or come in tonight, but between six and eight. So this is the kind of thing that, that people uh, will want more and more. Uh, economic lot size, even today, okay? Big companies, they will say to clients, uh, you order whatever you want, but I'm gonna deliver when I've got a full truckload. Okay? It may be twice a day, but it can be once a month. And, it, and that's it, otherwise uh, get your stuff elsewhere. This is not what we should expect in 2017. On my channel, I'll talk about this, but we're beginning to do, to do, to do uh, good stuff, but it's just the beginning, okay? And I'll explain what I'm meaning by that later on. We're, we're way out. Cross-border complexity and delays is a huge matter uh, in there. Uh, your capability to deploy internationally, you're, you're an SME, you got this great product. How much time before you can say that you cover the US smartly and are ready to, to deliver to orders okay, smartly? For companies, it may be literally many years before this happens. Okay? So big issues. City logistics, uh, like what's happening in Atlanta, so there's big initiative to an under smart city type of time development. A lot of it deals with getting our cities much smarter to deal with the flow of goods and people, interlacing them and doing so smartly. So again, a lot of potential. Supply chain security, a very limited proportion of what we ship is really under control and secured. Okay? The rest, we cross our fingers. Okay, so that, that is bad. Okay, supply chain robustness, resilience. We've centralized a lot of things in big centralized, uh, big dedicated uh, distribution centers that serve big region. If something happened to that distribution center, you're in big trouble. Okay, same for your factories. We're channeling a lot of flows in, in very limited lines. So those are, 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 are very dangerous in there. And automation, innovation, they're scaled down, okay, they're, because Everybody is dealing with it, their own little part, and everybody wants to secure their, their part, a piece of the pie. An example of this, okay, for me is uh, if you are selling conveyors and you just sold for $3 million of conveyors to a given company, and then you've got this gentleman here that sells conveyors also, and this one sells conveyors, as the first company that just sold three, three five millions of conveyors, do you want okay, your conveyors to be easy to snap fit with others, other other, the conveyors of other companies? The answer is dramatically no, okay? And that's a huge killer, okay? It's like in the old time, and still a bit like this some places, they purposely put the railroads okay, at different widths so that the, 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 the trains from one country could not get in the other one. Okay? We're stuck with huge amount of this, physical and software also. So the, all across the field. So I took a bit of time because that's, that's what I'm working to try to solve. Clearly there's, there's gonna be millions of people trying to help this, but can we help steer it in the right direction? So basically when I'm summarizing everything and synthesizing what we're talking about, I'm talking about improving by an order of magnitude the economical, environmental, and societal efficiency and sustainability of the way physical objects are moved, deployed, realized, supplied, designed, and used all across the world. So we're talking inducing large cost reductions, price reductions at the, at the ticket counter for people, a lot of business opportunities, a lot of economic development opportunities also, reduction of greenhouse gas emission, energy consumption, waste pollution, traffic congestions, and also improving quality of life of the workers of the domain, as well as population in general. And also be able to offer new services that right now we're not capable of offering. So many people, when I say order of magnitude, they begin to laugh, okay? Internally or loudly, okay? Because they're, they're in a world that where you, where you save three person, five person, you're a hero, okay? And I'm coming in with order of magnitude. But in this domain, you have to understand that in the past, we've succeeded this. And we succeeded very strongly and vividly. And let me show you what I'm talking about. And, the, what I'm, and my example is the container. 
Very, very simple. I'm talking, let's go in the early 60s, late 50s, that kind of time. And I had to ship the equivalent of a container from Chicago to Nancy in France. Okay. It would at that time cost us on the order of $2,000. Okay. If I take those dollars and bring them into our kind of dollars now, okay, this means that it would normally cost us on the order of $14,000. But in practice, it cost us on the order of $4,000 to do the same. Okay. What did happen? Well, Container, we, we containerized much of the goods. All the handling equipment in the ports were redesigned to deal with this. The ships were redesigned to deal with this. The ship were able to grow with much less staffing, etc. The trains, okay, and the trucks are capable of dealing with the, the, the containers and so on. So we end up with the handling cost at ports, okay, and all the nodes has been divided by 14. So that's not 14 person, that's divided by 14. Okay? The maritime trip cost has been divided by 4.5 and the trucking cost has been reduced by 1.5. Those are huge number. Okay? And those are just history, okay? That's really what happened. Now, all this story about the physical internet has a very precise start point, okay? The start point is basically around June 17, 2006. Okay. There was the, the, the economist, as usual, they come up with good stuff, okay? And I was in an air, uh, an airport in Europe and I had to go back to, the, uh, to North America and uh, I wanted something to read, not too heavy, and I found this, okay, at the bookstore. Hmm, looks interesting. A survey of logistics, the physical internet, what it's all about, okay? So I grab the, the magazine and in the plane, I begin to read. Very nice articles, okay? But the words physical internet appeared only once and it's on the title page. Yeah. Yes, they showed me how, uh, uh, like lobster, I think, okay, were, were, were channeled all across the road to get got into all the restaurants and, and they're still alive and all that's so pretty good. I like that. But what's a physical internet? That was even fuzzier than when I, when I, be, when I just read it. So as a researcher, that's where you begin to lose sleep, okay? Because now you begin to think, well, what could be a physical internet? And then you begin to spin and you do crazy stuff. And then after a few months, it begins to take shape a, a bit more. And after like, I, I, I went idle and not idle, but uh, quiet okay, under, under, under water for something like a year building what this could be. And then I started chatting with my friends about it. And after I was improving all the time. And after a while, I got to a point where I had a good story, okay? I, I was able to describe what would be a physical internet. But then I knew that if I was going to go there, this would be a big deal in my career because I would have to invest so much to make this happen, okay, that it, it's unbelievable. So I had to convince myself that it would really make sense for me to, to, do, to do this, okay? So I, end, I ended up asking myself, okay, why in the world would I make so much changes, so many changes all across the world, okay, as it is working now? That's when I started asking myself questions about what's wrong with the system. So the early slides that I've showed you, okay, were when I got to the point when I thought we had something potential that be worth maybe going. So I spent like six months a year trying to convince myself that it was worth moving forward. Okay. Then that's when I began to go public. I, I went public in 2009 and I knew this was kind of bombshell type of things. So I said, I'm not going to try to get it in a journal right now. It's too fast. So I went on the web, created this page with physicalinternetinitiative.org and put out there the physical internet manifesto. Okay which was a, a growing set of slides that were explaining what this was all about, basically. 
Okay? And I started doing this. And finally, in 2011, then we were ready. We put a good journal paper out of it. And then the story builds uh, from then on. But I wanted to, for you to understand this. Now, when I say physical internet from now on, we all understand that information, I can double it, I, I'm not losing it. If I'm putting a video somewhere, I can send thousands of copies of the same video. I don't have to, to, to get new ones every time. When I'm moving goods, I have to pay every time. There's going to be delays every time. When I'm moving information, and, and the, the information about what's moving and what's moving are going at the same speed. In our case, it's very different because the, the, the physical good move at a physical pace while the other one goes, shoom, okay? So I know it's coming in, in two hours, coming in one hour, it's coming in 30 minutes, coming in 15 minutes, it's at the gate, etc. So and I, I get a lot of information that I don't have in the digital, in digital internet. So it's never been our goal to say that we're going to copy it. It'd be stupid, okay? And remember, by the way, that all this notion of digital internet before they talk about digital internet, they talk about the information highway, information superhighway, which is a metaphor from transportation and logistics. So that's why they've got routers, they've got bridges, and all kinds of things okay, that, that they're dealing with in, in, in the internet, and because they use our metaphor. So I say, let's use their metaphor. So everything I'm doing is going to be exploiting that metaphor. Uh, we had to formalize definitions as we grew in there. That's the latest version of the definition. Uh, it's, it's technical, but I think it reflects reasonably what we're talking about. So it's an hyper-connected global logistics system that is enabling seamless open asset sharing and flow consolidation. And it does so through standardized encapsulation, modularization, protocols, and interfaces. The, the tough word in there is hyperconnected. Okay, why in the world are you hyperbolizing everything, etc.? No, it says here a system is said to be hyperconnected when its components, agents, things, whatever you want, okay, are intensely interconnected on multiple layers, ultimately anytime, anywhere. In our, in our case, the layers are a physical layer. So this truck, does it connect with the other one? The, con the conveyors, can they connect in there? So is this working together? Uh, digital, so knowing the information about in, in digital transaction, etc. Operational, so does the trucker or the material handler or whatever know exactly what to do there? And there's protocol that explain how to do it. So let's try to make this happen. Business, uh, business interconnectivity, making sure that the transactions, the payments, okay, all the liability issues, uh, responsibility, etc., contracting, that this is getting much, much smoother than what we have now. Legal, I talked about liability, there's insurance, etc., but there's all this stuff about the, <coughs> the customs, okay, what's happening when several people touch the same goods, uh, who's going to be responsible, etc. So there's a bunch of issues uh, in there. And interpersonal, because there's going to, millions of people are involved in, in such activities. So that gives us like the overall picture. So basically, we do the physical internet because we want to improve the way we deal with physical objects. And by the way, my definition here of physical object is very uh, uh, technical in the sense that you and I are physical objects. Chicken are figures physical objects, so beings and things okay, are in there. But obviously, I'm not going to right now at least design people, okay, but uh, you, you understand that many of them will, will apply. Uh, just a second. And basically, we're trying to get like the logistics, the supply chain, the transportation, okay, to be much more efficient, sustainable, smart, agile, adaptable, scalable, resilient, and I could go on, okay. But at least those can cover most of the essence of what we're trying to shoot for. Another way to see what we're building here is to contrast with the internets that exist or are shaping. One, one that is shaping, uh, that is there, is the digital internet. We understand that. Then I'm coming up here with the physical internet, with the logistics web instead of a World Wide Web. Uh, where it's, instead of digital information packets we deal with, it's going to be smart physical packets uh, we're dealing with. 
And in between, we have the Internet of Things, which receives a lot of, uh, of technological push now and begins to, to get grown to adoption. There's a lot of hype related to it, but there's also a lot of potential. So it's basically about connecting the objects, the digital and the physical, connect them, connecting them to the web and being, enabling people and objects and objects between themselves to talk to each other. And there, that's where we've got all the, the sensors, okay, and everything be able to have autonomous vehicles, autonomous objects, etc. That's all the domain of Internet of Things here. So it's, we're going to exploit this. And also we have like the energy domain that is used to be very standard uh, type of networks. Now we're talking much more about smart grids. So with all kind of producer, consumers and, and multi-modes of uh, getting with the energy. So we're talking about this essentially an energy Internet. And what we're telling is that we're evolving toward an infrastructure where the world will be dominated okay, by these big infrastructure that are going to be upper connected type of infrastructure and, and they're going to interact with them. Okay, okay now what I'm going to do for a while is uh, go beyond like the big overall picture and try to tell you more what it's really the physical internet. And the way to do it is not to look under the hood yet. Okay? It's more looking at what we're trying to do, okay? really do with it. So basically we're trying to have logistics, transportation, production, supply chains. I could add others, but those are the key ones okay? that we're trying to get them to evolve. When I was a young student, and even when I was studying in the 70s here at Georgia Tech, we were mostly in the atomistic era. We're beginning to go away from here, but it was just the beginning. So we would optimize production for a given unit. Okay? We would optimize for this product, for this warehouse. Everything was kind of isolated. So we would have a lot of fragmentation, solo operation. So we would live with huge lead times, big lots, large inventory. That would be our world in there. That era is mostly obsolete. Okay? Most of the companies right now, they are in the integrated era. So the idea is to control from end to end, from customers, customers, all the way to suppliers, to suppliers. I want to control this. And oftentimes it relates to owning the key pieces. And even in the key pieces, oftentimes it's uh, let's have this multi, multi million DC or fulfillment center okay, that will do it, or this gigantic factory. We've got one or two on the continent. So there's a lot of this that is going on. Okay? This is the world of EDI, okay, just in time efficient consumer response, uh, lean, etc. We see it all over. Yet, even if you're the biggest companies, you learn okay, that you're never big enough. Whatever you're trying to integrate and didscate and do by yourself, you're never big enough. I, I was dealing with huge companies, I cannot name them publicly, but for decades and decades they tried to do something good but could not justify it. So basically, that is, since it's very asset intensive and bounding. So the best players for at least a decade, okay, at least, and it's 15 years at least now, uh, they're basically uh, trying, exploring collaborative, the collaborative era. So this means that, uh, can we be together, okay? So maybe client suppliers or, or several suppliers in a given domain or several providers and say, can we do better by acting together? Okay. So, and I even wrote a book on that style of things in 1994. Okay, so, so the, those, those, th those are ideas that have, that, have seen, that have a lot of potentials. But then we get economies of scales, economies of scope as we do this, we can be greener, etc. But with time you learn, okay, that there are three big hurdles, okay? They are long to deal because those are partnerships, consortium, whatever you want to call them, strategic alliances, had to climb up to the board, get the approval of everybody, et cetera. It's a big deal, okay? Once you've got it signed, then it took two, three years, and the market has changed, technology has evolved, you want to change it, it's tough to adapt. Okay? And third, we did all this for two companies, or we did it for three companies. What about five, seven, 10, 20? 100, 1,000, 100,000. 
I've lost them since a long time, okay? That's where we're trying to shoot, okay? And trying to leapfrog most of the companies to go to the hyper-connected era. And that's where we got the physical internet, logistics web. We're gonna talk about open ops, DCs, fab, cooperation platforms in there, and, and to work in very different ways, okay? It's a bit, if you think about it, is uh, there are many countries that a while back, if you go a few decades, you would have just a few phone in, a, in you'd have less like a one phone for 10 person in the country okay while now they've reached a stage where they have like 1.2 phones for for every people in the country and i'm talking countries like morocco tunisia and then places like that the the old system didn't fit their reality now they've got with all the cellular stuff and so on and now it's much much easier so most of them are leapfrogging so we see a bunch of things and in our domain Places that are a lot prone to leapfrog are, are the developing countries, okay? Starting with China, India, uh, South America, Africa, and all that. Those are places that they're, they're bound to leapfrog because they don't have to do the same kind of investment within the last 30, 50 years. They can already think forward. So a lot to, to see uh, from those countries and continents. So let's start. So, First, let's take a small example, okay? We have got two manufacturers, two retailers. Manufacturers have their plants and they ship to a distribution center, mixing center, warehouse, call it whatever you want there, okay? And then from there, they will ship to the, the retailers, mostly at their distribution centers, and then they'll feed their stores or their e-drives, okay, for, for e-commerce pickup, et cetera. So, so that's basically the kind of system that I'm showing here. Right now when I'm moving stuff from one to another, basically, okay, I'm going direct. So that's what I'm showing here. So and it's optimized on, on a one-to-one -one basis. What we're telling is in the internet that's not the way you do. Okay? If I want to go to from here to Shanghai, it's going to go to a router, go to another router, go to another router, and finally we'll get there and then re be reassembled. So, here what we show is the same. Can we put a network of open hubs? And so what you do is just go to the nearest hub, be consolidated with many others that are going in the same direction, go from hub to hub, depending on the distance, okay? And finally you end up at your place. So we're doing this openly. What, what a company like FedEx, UPS, will try to do within itself or, or less than truckload companies, but they do it with their own limitations, okay? So we see already that we have uh, very significant potential. Uh, that was moving the goods. Just to show you what it's all about when I'm talking about deploying the goods, storing the goods. So the idea here is that in my little example, I told you that you would go from the plant to the DCs, okay? And, and for the manufacturer's DCs, and then go to the DCs of the retailer, and then go there. But on the web right now, okay, and in the internet, Basically, we're talking about cloud storage in all variants of this, okay? So the idea in our context is say, they don't have to own their own DCs. They don't have to say that they are gonna put it all in this one, whether they own it or not. Now they can say, I can deploy anytime all across this network here. So basically, in our context, this means that instead of shipping to the always the, the right one and then to all the, the sort, everybody here will be deploying so that it gets as smartly near to the, the, the clients or at critical points where they can, they can fan out as needed. Okay? So we get huge 40-something uh, improvement uh, on, on the, the like fuel and travel. Now, another one that I have to talk is product realization. The, the most vivid way to express it right now is through uh, uh, understanding what's happening with uh, 3D printing, okay? So basically, we have in mind that you need a big factory to do something. They're telling, no, no, it's like printing papers. Now we're printing goods, okay? So the idea is to send me the information, send me the raw material, and then we put it in the printer, crunch, you've got your objects. So in fact, as this develop, it completely transform how we think supply chains. So basically, I can put a bunch of them, I can have 
like we have copy shop everywhere now I can have 3D printing shops many many places some will be more or less sophisticated but they can print anything as long as they've got the digital information on what's needed and the right equipment and the right material so huge difference game in there and that does not necessarily force to have 3D printing but 3D printing is like the the image okay, that people grasp on rapidly what it's all about for most companies though they're not gonna the 3D printing will just be a little part of it but many for many the vision is okay we have this big central factory that's gonna produce and assemble and then we say yeah but you could produce and then assemble nearer this is basic stuff but then what we say is okay you could produce and then deal with set of open assemblers that you're going to connect on demand in there and here i'm pushing even further i don't even have this factory i've got open producers okay and i decide where it's going to be produced live connect to where it's going to be assembled live or finished live and then get it to near whatever when i'm doing this i'm removing a lot of pressure from the fast delivery and the large inventory style that i talked earlier so that's part of the overall picture now, very fast on this because I could expand quite a lot, but on the supply side, it changes a lot the game because like I'm dealing with companies now, they have like uh, hundreds of products, but then if you go back, they have literally many hundreds of suppliers. Those suppliers, most of the time, they are a break, okay? They, they, they're not enabling them to do whatever they want here at the OEM level. Now imagine that all those suppliers have access to the hyperconnected transportation, distribution, and production and realization that I've mentioned earlier. It just completely changed the game. So for example, why would I have distribution centers okay, for the retailers and distribution centers for the manufacturer? Why can't I have a site that it's going to be owned by the retailer or by the manufacturer? Whoop it, now it's owned by the retailer. Okay? So there are all kinds of options that we can do that, that are not possible yet uh, in there. So that's the spirit of the operating supply. So technically, that's an image of, 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 the, of the internet and nodes in there. So what we say is, imagine that you'd be playing with a supply web with myriads of Pi, Pi is physical internet certified suppliers, open and global access, so you know where they are, how to access them, standardized contracts, open monitoring of what's happening in there, and supplier ratings as you want. So it makes the, the, the kind of life, uh, industrial life that we're at, used to would be completely transformed. Now I've talked about using the goods. That's, that's a very powerful one, okay? We see it now in the normal world, okay, with companies like Airbnb. Okay. Airbnb basically, what they, they don't have assets. They just have this interface, okay, in those connections, where if you've got some place that you'd like to make available for people in your house apartment or your own apartment, you're just gonna go in and make it available. Sorry, <clears throat> in there. And, and basically, uh, you've got the other side. If people want to have access, instead of going to an hotel, they'll go through, through this and you, they're gonna make this happen easily. We see it with Uber for transportation and, and so on. Do you know that right now the market value of Airbnb is bigger than Hilton? Yeah. This is almost unbelievable when you think about it, okay? No assets. This is the kind of new world. Here what we're telling is, for example, let's say that you, uh, you've got the circular saws to cut wood, okay? Well, I come from Canada and almost every house okay, will have at least one of them. Okay? Even apartments will have. So basically in Quebec City, where I was coming from, there's like 800,000 people. The hypothesis, there are at least 250, 300,000 circular saws available. Then I asked to a crowd, I had hundreds of people here, okay? How many do you think are used right now? Okay? Biggest number I've ever you, uh, uh, heard was like 2,000, okay? I said, okay, let's go to the biggest time of the year where everybody's doing renovations, etc. I never heard more than 20, 30,000 okay, in there. And we have 250, 300,000 at minimum. Okay? So by being smart, could we do otherwise? So the image here is when you get to the store to buy one, you now have three choices. Okay? One choice is I buy it 
and I'm buying something to shine it because it's going to be in my place. Nobody else will touch it but me. Okay. First choice. Second choice, we're going to put it in a modular container. And when you don't use it, we're going to put it in the vicinity, near neighborhood around so that if people need one, they're going to be able to use it. They're going to pay you. You're going to receive it. You receive money from it. And we will make sure that it's well maintained and clean so that when you need it, it's fine. And you're always going to have priority. So normally when I ask people in the room what they would do, vast majority okay, go with this second one. Okay? Some people, they're the style that they like to shine it, so I respect that. And then there are always other people that think about it a bit and say, I wouldn't buy. I would use the ones that are available. Okay? That's the spirit of what we're talking here. Okay? The other side of it is, uh, is uh, decoupling the person that's doing the stuff from the objects so that you can use virtuality so that you, for example, you need a specialist in the north of Canada, okay? So instead of sending like 10 specialists to the north, you send one person that's capable of handling multiple equipments and then remotely by uh, augmented reality and, uh, and the remote vision. So they are interacting with that person, but the specialists are in their office. They can give their reports within one day instead of being stored in the north and having to get them on snowmobiles and airplane, etc. Okay, and it would cost much more, and the reports would be like weeks later. So those are the kind of two things we're doing there. So it gives you the style of what we're trying to achieve there. Now let's look under the hood. Okay, under the hood, basically, uh, what, because there's what we do with it, but now what is it? Okay, basically, uh, the key building blocks are first certified open logistic service providers. Uh, the physical internet era has a lot of those service providers, but very professional, certified, and so on. We've got uh, open logistics uh, decision and transaction platforms to be able to make this open environment easy to deal with. Global logistic monitoring system. We want to make sure that every part, okay, every container, modular pack okay, that we're dealing with, we can track all the time, never losing it uh, in there. Standard logistics protocol so that everybody knows how we do the game. Okay, and it's the same everywhere. Uh, unified set of standard modular logistics container. We're going to see this basically, but the idea is that the, the, the way the internet doesn't deal with any kind of information. It deals only with data packets. Okay? Your email, it breaks it down in data packets, and then that's what's being moved, transmitted around the, the digital internet. Here we're going to do the same. Everything that we move, we move within a modular container. Then we design the equipment the same way we did for the big container. Okay? We redesign the handling storage equipment, the transport vehicles, so that they're, they're smart at dealing with, the, with those designed for logistics modular containers. And then we do the same with the facilities, the highways, etc., so that we can track easily and do the kind of, of interchange that we want to do easily. So when we're talking encapsulation okay, into standard modular containers, we want containers that are going to be easy to handle, store and transport, going to be smart and connected, eco-friendly, and there's going to be from very small okay, to big ones. Okay? So basically the kind of logic is I can snap them together and they become one. I can move them without having to rely on a forklift okay? because I just have connectors and a click okay, and I move with it. Okay, so uh, the, the, we, we are right now in the reflection, it's, it's at having three levels of containers, transport, handling, and packaging containers. So it's like the Russian dolls, okay, in there, but at the given level, it's not like Lego style, okay, that we have here. So the, we call them pods here, pie pods, uh, that basically from the, the 40 foot container, 20 foot, 12 meters, 6 meter, but go down to 4.8, 3.6, 2.4, 1.2, that you get roughly. Those are rough, okay, they go outside, okay, in the rain, the snow, the ice, whatever, that you just put on a flat bed and, it, and it's okay. Then you've got the handling containers that are replacing the totes, the, 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 the shrink wrap pallets that we have and all that, okay, in the cages and so on. So those are what we call our pie boxes. Okay? They are designed dimensionally so that they fit nicely within these. Okay? 
And again, they're very modular. And then we've got packaging containers. That's where you want all the, the relational stuff, the publicity stuff, information, etc. So we want to be tiny. So we say here, what we're focusing and making sure the dimensions are standardized much more, and then connectors in the corners, maybe the edges and so on, but something light so that we can still express ourselves uh, in many ways. But again, those would be designed so that they fit nicely into this and so on. So very rapidly, the idea here is what I'm showing is that uh, if you're a consumer product goods uh, a company, you'll have thousands of products. Here I got a thousand, which will reflect in about 500, 900 package size. Okay, and then those will be put into case cases. And again, I'll have hundreds of case size that will be put on pallets, and and those pallets will be here. They're very nice, okay, because they're done at the manufacturer. But those are more typical of what you'll find in on the downstream side of it. So you're losing, and then you're going to put this in trucks okay but how are you gonna put something above this so most of the trucks okay the upper part is not used in there so we're losing a lot of space so that's a kind of spirit so I'm showing kind of rough cut estimates to show that in average you end up less than 10% utilization when you think about what was really inside but then what we're trying to do is design the products so that they fit into modular containers okay so that we get into our pie packs, okay, or, or pie box, whatever you want, the size what you're dealing, it fits nicely, pretty well, then we put these into pie boxes, we put them in pie pods, and then we put them on transporters, okay, but everything has been defined, so our average space is now multiplied by orders of magnitude better than what we had before. <coughs> So what I said earlier, you just clip se several modular containers together. You just attach some wheels below and you begin to move with it. it if, are, if they are self-propelled, then you've got an automated vehicle. Here's a f what looks like a forklift, no forks. I don't need it. I just snap and move. Uh, conveyors that now understand the, the modular dimensions, the fact that I, I, I have those connectors, so they're conceptually done very differently than what we have. I can stack things like I have in ports, okay, but now I can have it much more efficient than what we have. I've got rackings, okay, where there's no support. I just clip them to a grid. So all kind of variations. I can transform my ports, my, uh, not my ports, my trucks, my, my uh, personal vehicles, uh, etc. I can attach them to drones, droids, or whatever you want uh, in there. And then we, you put all these pieces and then transform the landscape for our facilities. And sites here is a, is a small uh, port, but you see that uh, stuff is already prepared to load it. We're unloading it. As we unload, we hope that the trucks are already there. Otherwise, we're prepared to, 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 to get them in there so that we flow this very nicely, very rapidly uh, in there. So that, that's the style of what we're having. So let's hope I can start this. Sorry. I'll just show you. This is a, uh, this is a simulation that shows a, a rail and in, in, in road uh, hub. You see the train is advancing by five rail car at the time. We unload the, the container on one side if they go by road. The other side, if they're going to go on the next train, and meanwhile, when it advances, we load with the uh, with the other on the other side. So there's no almost no stoppage in, in about half an hour to four, to one hour. The train is already gone, okay, and the trucks are already gone, and we're ready for next round. This is huge throughput, okay, in there. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, I talked about protocols also okay, earlier. So in the internet, we have the open uh, system interconnection, the OSI model, the TCP IP type of protocols. Then we're, we'll have to need the equivalent, we'll need the equivalent on the physical side. So we invented the open logistics interconnection model. So in, in working now on, on shaping what those protocols would, uh, would look like. I don't want to get into the details, but it goes all the way from physical to all the logistics web level. Uh, Internet of Things I mentioned earlier, for us it's nice and, and very important with Internet of Things that the current view is that you, you should put tags on everything and follow everything. For logistics supply chain perspective, many times that's not what we need to do. Okay? We just need to tag the containers, the modular containers, 
track them. Okay? And now we're smart. So instead of having billions, we've reduced by an order of magnitude what we need to track. And they're standard, reutilizable, etc. So it makes our life much easier uh, to do. And then those containers will be interacting with what's inside okay, in there. And the, the conceptually, this is the same logic, whether I'm talking globally across the world, I'm talking at the state provincial level, I'm talking at the city level, a campus level, a facility level, or some, some room or, or department within, within a building. It's the same logic everywhere that we're applying. <coughs> now what I'm gonna try to do in the next few minutes is, is give you insights very rapidly, video mode, okay? A snapshot about studies that we've been doing on a larger scale, okay? So that was one of the first slides that I showed the world about hyperconnected transportation. And I said, what's the simplest? Well, the simplest is I've got a truck, okay? A trailer that I need to ship from Quebec City and get it to Los Angeles, okay? Simple trailer, okay? So what do you do the simplest you can think of? Well, you, you call the carrier and it brings a, a trucker in, in, in a truck, attach it okay, to the semi-trailer and go cowboy, go, I'll see you in LA. Okay? So it's gonna get to LA in 120 hours. Now when he gets there, then he's got to find something else to, to come back eventually to Quebec City. So if it is in good company, they may have planned things ahead, but maybe he'll end up in uh, Houston, and then later maybe he's gonna end up in Atlanta, and then to Chicago, then New York, then Toronto, and finally he may end up in Quebec City. For some people, this is paradise, okay? For most truckers, this is bad, okay? That's why you got so much turnover, okay? So what we're showing here is what if from Quebec City, you just drive to Montreal nearby, you go in the transit center, I'll show you, okay, and say park in B32 on Oak, and then go in C45 and pick this up and go back to Quebec City. Okay, go to your wife, your kid, your, your spouse, your girlfriend, whatever it is, okay, uh, in there. So life is much better, they can run like this. So everyone will be doing this way. You get it? So all the way. So in this case, 17, okay, uh, different load on load. At each place I spend roughly in the order of one hour. But the idea is I get to LA in 60 hours instead of 120 because I've decoupled the constraints of the driver with the constraints of the trailer. The trailer wants to go to LA. The driver has to sleep, eat, they've got regulations, a bunch of things. So we've completely decoupled this. Okay? So huge potential there. Then we said, okay, this is a very simple example. What if we do it large scale? Well, no, before we had to, sorry, I have to click this again. Either I don't know how to play it or, or there's a trick. Anyway, what you're gonna see here is one of those transit center. They're basically like, a, like a truck stops okay, that you have along the roads, but more sophisticated. First, they're taught to be environmentally clean, okay, so green with a bunch of things. Uh, space for truckers that have to wait if they have to wait. Uh, then exchange done very rigorously, okay, with gateways to get, get, deal with security. So that all of this is done very efficiently and very safely in there, okay? So that's the kind of thing uh, we're talking about. And when we made a study in, in the province of Quebec where we took, we modeled the full transportation of trailers in the province, okay, from days to days, hours to hours, okay, from long periods. And we, we, we knew where all the industrial parks and everything were, were, so we generated demands, okay, so which is basically I need this trailer to be shipped there. That corresponds to all the, ma the macro flow that we know ab about the province, but did it on an individual basis and, and put some lead time about when they wanted their stuff to be in. Some of the stuff is intra-provincial, some comes from the US, Ontario, and so on, gets into Quebec, and some will get from Quebec and wants to go somewhere else. Okay? So we look at all of this, and then computed, made a bunch of simulation looking at what's happening, and we did it first the current way, basically, assuming that it's single truck companies, okay, simplifying a bit, but then we did it like a physical internet way, and then contrasted the results. Okay? Physical internet way, you understand that I'm gonna go from hub to hub, those were, transit center would be an intersection of highway, borders near around the cities near the train to do exchanges etc so 
we show that in, in red, in green here is physical internet in, on that slide, so that in terms of equivalent distances, we're always better. 2.5 tells you how many vehicles, how many drivers we're talking about in the order of 10,000. Uh, so that was designed for this level, okay? So this kind of optimized. So that's where uh, our, our normal system performs the best, okay? And the worst, but we're still better. And then diesel con consumption, it's the same kind of curve. Uh, order delivery performance, because each one has a delivery. So we look at total order deliveries, okay? The, the PI version always beat. Orders deliver delivered without delay, always, again, we beat all the time. Total cost, okay? Uh, here I'm showing in Quebec, but it's overall, okay? We're, we're beating every time, depending on which level. Even the best one of these is much higher than what we get uh, when we deal with the, the overall cost, including everything okay, so associated to make it happen. And then we looked at all the environmental, service, social, etc. So make the case very rigorously that this could really work okay, in there. <coughs> also, things that we're looking at right now is, for example, there's a lot of emphasis on, on platooning. Platooning when people want to go everywhere from everywhere is something tough. But platooning when everybody is shifting from transit center to transit center or up to up is much easier to do. Okay? So, it's, so it, there's a lot of potential to gain uh, for, for platooning on those levels. So we're working on, on, on those aspects. Now, that was just trailers, okay? But life is not trailer, okay? So we, we took uh, uh, in, in France the Carrefour Casino, those are the Kroger and Walmart of, 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 of uh, France. So we took uh, the top two of the leading retailers, their top 100 suppliers, over 300 factories. You see the numbers, okay, huge numbers. We had all their data all across the board, okay? And then what we did is simulate, okay, what they were doing, recorded all all the, the, the metrics like I did earlier, so that was done. We designed what would be a national hub of, 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 of hubs, okay, a national network of hubs across France with roughly in the order of 50 uh, single mode and 20 that would be truck and train. In there, so we optimize this uh, in there. We define the protocols, okay, for packing the containers, uh, for routing the containers, as well as consolidating containers uh, into, uh, into vehicles as we're moving this and implement this uh, across the, 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 the world, uh, the, the, the country. And basically what we show is those are the flows current, okay? Those are the flows when we use the physical internet. Okay, so you see that we've got much more consolidation than there, and but both of them are exploiting the same road system, but the one on the left could not exploit the rails because there was not enough consolidation, which we could do. So we ended up with saving 30% overall cost and over 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emission. Okay, not changing huge technologies in the back. Okay. I'll pass this because I'm lacking time, but ideally what we're aiming is to, we're working is designing, engineering the, those cross dock hubs, okay, that, that are necessary to make this happen. So we're building this new generation of very smart, agile hubs. So a truck gets in and out within five minutes in there. Okay. So in practice though, companies are beginning to listen to this, okay? So for example, in France, okay, you've got CRC services that just won the King of the Supply Chain Award in France, okay? And basically they started with a routing center like a hub in south, southwest of France, and then they get another one, get another one. They're now at five and they're climbing to 12 within the next year. And they've got a bunch of nice companies and saving them a bundle of money and being greener. Uh, we did studies on, on the actual storing of the good distribution, so not moving them now mostly, and we look at cases where companies would have their own distribution network when they're partnering with others to have collaborative distribution networks, and then when they're using an hyper-connected distribution web in which they're picking where to, where to store, okay, because they don't have to build anything, they're just exploiting it. And basically, we get very nice uh, improvement, again, on the order of 33% on this. Companies like ES3, 
uh, in York, Pennsylvania, are playing this game, uh, receiving stock from manufacturers, full truck load, shipping to retailers, full truck load. But here, the full truck load are single vendor. Here, they're multi-vendor. And they shorten the cycle, reduce a bunch of money uh, of cost associated with this. They're pretty smart and getting the products much faster to, to the retailer. You've got companies like Flex.com. Basically, it's easy to understand. They're doing like Airbnb, but for product storage. Okay? Starting with pallets at the beginning, and you've got the price for labor, the price for storage per, per week, and you just, you just decide how much you where and want to do it. So you can deal with fluctuation and demands on, of, of inventory space okay? and play with it. So they started one state. They're now in 26 states and growing like crazy. Okay. Amazon, okay? Amazon has recently become the first large-scale asset-based okay, uh, player in the hyper-connected distribution world okay, that offers uh, service and uh, warehousing and fulfillment services. They installed this solid base over over 100 okay, fulfillment centers across uh, the United States, invested so that they're very, very uh, well, well designed and well operated. At the beginning, it was just for them. Then, okay, they opened it to the vendors that sell on Amazon for the products they sell on Amazon. Now in phase three, okay, they're opening to anybody. Okay? So it's like a cloud storage for, uh, for real goods. But understand that while uh, Amazon is making a bundle of money on cloud storage on the digital side, so they're learning. Okay, that's exactly what we were telling. And now you've got one of the top companies in the world that is bandwagging, wagging with what we're doing. <coughs> uh, a very well-known company here, Procter and Gamble. We're working with them on a, on a very nice project right now, where basically in the past that were their distribution network with all their factories and, and they're serving all their clients. And basically there was, if I simplify, it's almost one distribution center per factory and it would ship okay, truckload to all the clients from there. So a given client would receive many different trucks from PNG uh, coming from very uh, different divisions. Now they've changed this to have a cons consumer re customer responsive network with mixing center where they group, uh, they send all the, all the factories sent to those mixing center and from there they serve a region. Okay? Well, this is good, but there are still big, big issues. And now it's confidential. I cannot go into all the detail at this stage, okay? But there are big issues with this, okay? Now we're working with them at understanding what would be next, okay? Understanding that we're going to use the concept that I've just explained uh, in last uh, last uh, almost hour, okay, there. Uh, cities, okay? Uh, we think cities as, as intranet, okay? So we put gateways around cities, we facilitate, okay, uh, the, the, the travel between those gateways there, going radial, okay, getting into layers and their rings if you want. And so as you get nearer, you get smarter, smaller, okay, more green vehicles and so on. If you get in the given suburbs and so on, those could be smart lockers, okay? At the end, you can go with drones, droids, uh, bicycles, whatever you want. And at other places, you can have automated system because you got a lot of flow, but we're structuring all this. And look at this here and look at Atlanta. I could show you Beijing, could show you many things. So we're working at hyper-connected uh, city logistics along the lines I've mentioned. Uh, how much time do I have, uh, Tim? Okay, so hyper-connected omni-channel logistics, okay? So now people want to buy from any kind of source and channel and want to be delivered all kind of ways. What we're showing is basically the kind of picture that we have. We, you get from a plant, you're gonna get into a mixing center, that's the manufacturer part, then to a distribution or a fulfillment centers, then get to a store or a drive or some lockers or directly at home or even to me. Okay, basically, I can pick up or I can be delivered where, where I am. So all kinds of options. So, so companies are, that's what the customers expect, okay, basically. 
So how do we make this happen? Okay, just very rapidly, I could spend an hour just on, on that kind of stuff, okay? But basically, most of the companies will deal with three third-party service providers that will move the stuff from the plants to the retailers or e-commerce players, from these, okay, getting them to the point of store sales and so on, and others that will deal with delivery to Ohm or me in there. So, but the idea here is that they're fixing with whom they're playing for a long time. So, Technically, I could change all this and use the kind of things that I've been talking for an hour and making an hyper-connected transportation network underlying all this. But I say self-managed because each player would decide how they would ship their own stuff. Or I can have a bit the equivalent of this, but exploiting this, and now I've got an hyper-connected transportation with delivery orchestrators. Okay? So they're smart at exploiting all the players in there, so they don't touch the goods, but they're like a 4PL, but very, very smart dealing with hyperconnected transportation to deal with this. So we're going to see that kind of thing. Now, on the, where the stock is going to be placed, let me focus, for example, on the drives and the lockers. Okay? You've seen lockers okay, for, from UPS, Amazon, Walmart, whatever. But the idea is, if we're not careful, okay, we're going to end up with banks of lockers like side-by-side -side UPS, FedEx, DHL, Amazon, uh, Home Depot, Walmart, et cetera, et cetera. And so our cities, communities will get crazy, okay? So that's not what should be done, okay? Basically, we should be much smarter and, and find ways so that those lockers and those drives will be multi-players so that in a given zone, I've got one, one, and just one, okay, and be much smarter. So those are things that, uh, that uh, we're looking from a PI perspective. Production, okay, we say where the goods produce in all this. Well, the easy answer is at the plant. That's what the plant is. I say, well, for some of it will be there, but you see everywhere you see a dot, we'll do some production. Even at home, we already do, because you buy a furniture and you spend two hours assembling it, okay? But you'll have 3D printers, you'll have all kinds of things happening so that you're gonna try to get the stuff and finish it, produce it, assemble it, okay, as near to the user. So what used to be simple for production has now become a completely different world, okay? We're even going to a world where the factories, as we think them right now, they're gonna become more and more obsolete because they're kind of large dinosaurs, okay? What we're gonna see more and more are factories where each production unit will be taught as being modular and as much snap fit as possible, okay? Click in, click out in there. And those are examples where the real companies like Bayer's, Procter Gamble's, they're testing that kind of stuff and this is a container. So they just back it, okay, shift it to another place as needed, okay? A lot of potential depending on, on dynamics in there. Europe is thinking about its big logistics network, okay? Uh, about thinking this is the 10T logistics network initiative in Europe where you see all the trade corridors and how they're linking it and so on. So now the idea okay, that they have in Europe is uh, more and more thinking that we will use the physical internet to get this to be uh, instantiated. It's not just about putting highways in, uh, in, uh, in connectors and so on. It's a lot more than this, and, and now we're interacting with them on this. You've got places in the world that they're very aggressive. This is an example from Switzerland. It's a business endeavor, okay, where their idea is to connect all the key cities of Switzerland okay, with a tunnel-based system in which everything that is now driven, like the cases, the pallets, and so on, that are now in trucks, will be going by themselves okay, uh, on, on shuttles. Okay, so pallets by pallets, equivalents, okay, get in there, and even cases by case, get to the city, then in the city, climb up, and then connect with what's in the city. Okay, those are projects with tons of, of venture capitalists and, and, and companies that are driving for this, very much in line with what we have, what we're talking about, but big infrastructure, okay? So there's gonna be needing for process innovation, technology innovation, infrastructure innovation. Necessary infrastructure, not that short term, but also very important are cultural innovation. So people who are still here but think that this is not going to happen, okay, that I've been dreaming. Uh, business model innovation, the equivalent for companies. Am I going to make money in there? I'm, a, I'm UPS, okay. Am I going to 
Am I going to let all those people become as good as I am? Okay, am I going to get good uh, in this new world? Okay, and so on. Uh, uh, legislative innovation to make this easier, etc. So we're going to have innovation that are going to enable okay, the, the physical internet and other innovations that are going to be enabled by the, the physical internet. Uh, I started that in my little lab, okay? But now Europe has made it its official uh, vision for, for, for supply chain logistics for the 30, 30, 2030, 2050 vision. So you can go on the web and see the, that everything they're trying to do is to create this physical internet by 2050, okay, uh, in there. Last thing is what we do as research in there. I've shown everything I've shown is result of research, okay? Uh, but basically, we work at concepts like vision, roadmaps, constituents, uh, implementing this, what's hyperconnected supply chain, and so on. Assessment studies using analysis, uh, all kind of analytical model, optimization, simulation. Uh, we do then when we think that makes sense, then we build up the solution to fill the gaps. It can be containers and link systems, decision models, digital platforms, whatever. And we would do validation studies with industry uh, in, in governments, okay? So case studies, field pilots, virtual pilots, living labs, et cetera. So that's the scope is uh, being done. So to finish, okay, uh, we're trying to tackle a grand challenge improving by an order of magnitude the way uh, we deal with physical objects, much more efficient, much more sustainable. Uh, we propose a grand vision, but also that leads to a pragmatic roadmap that we can start many things now and grow gradually. And industry is already beginning on the move. A uh, lot of potential for research and innovation and uh, across industry, governments, uh, academia, etc., and a lot of interdisciplinary uh, opportunities uh, in there. On this, Thank you very much. Been patient with me, and I hope it's been worthwhile for you. Take care. Sure. Any questions? It's, it's a very good question. It goes also with critical mass, okay, because there's notion of more people are in there, the better it is, and so on. Um, the big point is, for me, is when we're going to have, like, some industries or some ecosystems that begin to play a real physical internet game, okay, to a real solid level. And that world, the, the wider mass, they're now clearly physical internet type of services that are there and thriving, okay. And I'm, we're, we're beginning to see this, like a ES3 will put on its website, on its book that it's producing, et cetera, that its strategic vision is physical internet oriented, okay? So you begin to see it. You see Mercedes, okay? Go on the web and see Mercedes talking explicitly about transforming its vehicles, its systems, so that it's gonna be adapted to the new physical internet era. So, but, but it's tiny, okay, what's happening. So we think that within the next 10 years, we're gonna see more and more of this, of this stuff. But it's fun, okay, like a, a change, like what, what Amazon has been, done, has been doing, for us it's, it's really slick, okay, because now you take a company that, at the beginning when I was explaining my things, I say, they're almost the only one that can think of doing it just for themselves, okay. And suddenly, a kid they cut and, and, and switch, and now it becomes very interesting. So it's a tough question, but at the same time, uh, and, and I'm not, uh, I cannot tell you with certainty when things are going. I'll, I mentioned many years ago that uh, basically what I would love is that uh, before I retire, okay, uh, that I really see a big action, okay, and that when I die, then I can say that I'm mostly in a PI world, that'd be fun. Okay, so those are my two personal targets. Okay. And I've got another target, which is every month, I want to convince one more company to, to get in there because the, there's money to be made, okay? And there's a lot of impact to, uh, to be at. Yes? So, so related to that last question, and I'm not sure if it's a good question, but different industries have very different kind of supply chain logistics and setting. 
So is it, do, do you mean at some point for those different types of industries to cooperate on a standard, quote unquote, standard approach? Yeah. Or are you expecting that it'll, yeah. for example, I did a lot of work a couple of years ago in the automobile mm. industry, which yeah. is where there are huge transitions, yes. like outsourcing, bringing it back in, and so on. Yeah. And that's very different to the grocery industry. Yeah. You know, the agricultural industry. I'm wondering. I agree. Uh, yeah, at the beginning, we're, we're kind of starting, one way to attack this is we attack by ecosystem at the beginning, okay? But we tell everybody, don't think that you're doing this only by yourself, isolating yourself. But you know, when you've got good ecosystems like cold chain, automotive, consumer goods, uh, food, etc. So, I mean, there, there's potential there, okay, uh, to dealt in, in, you cannot, if you, if you deal, if you want just the perfect, you're not going to get to the, be the better or so on. So you got to make choices at one point. But clearly we can begin with them not being exactly the same, but at one point they'll understand that even though they're different, I, I can have washers and I uh, can have a whatever part of a car, okay? and it can be side by side with having uh, thermostats or whatever, okay? it's, even though they're different business, they go from same town to same town, so they're going to share. So at one point it's going to become irrelevant. Relevant. The logistics system will be serving all those industries. But in the transition, we still need that part. And I presented to the automotive logistics engineering community, and uh, we, like, I have a full kit that is oriented automotive, and it got pretty interesting results. Okay? It was very much fun to see how much they grasp it and how much they see it. And I'm, I'm working right now with, the, with Daimler and Mercedes, okay? And we're looking at very deep into their inbound logistics and how it's done. And we know that uh, there's huge potential, huge potential. So have you seen the smart rate program that we gave them, which is to encourage truckers to uh, basically cooperate? Yeah. yeah I, I, I've been talking with the few and I'm now at the point, you saw the kind of uh, uh, study that we did, okay, so now we've got numbers that are convincing enough so that they can really go to them and say, listen, we did it large scale and now we need to test it strongly. So yes, we've been talking with a, a few in there and slowly I'm, I'm talking with companies and one of the things we'd like to do is put consortiums in there where we can test that kind of thing large scale. But now we need multidisciplinary because we need civil, we need uh, uh, legal, business, uh, IT, we need uh, logistics supply chain, we need a bunch of people make this happen but that's, those are places we're going right now because we really believe there, there's potential. And those kind of programs, they're, they're marvelous. Okay, if we get the right people to understand and and, and go for it, then, then we, can, we can have a lot of potential. Yeah. You mentioned the transit centers at one point, you know, where you would transfer a container from you know, one driver to another. Uh, do any of those exist? And if so, who, who is it that owns and operates those? Uh, you, you've got a lot of cross docks okay, that exist, okay, a bunch of them. Rarely are they completely open. Like I told you the example in France of CRC services, that's exactly what they do. Okay? Now if you want a grand scale example of things that are shaping, just take like the Silk, uh, the Silk Road Railroad that is being built. Okay, from China, Russia, all the way to, uh, to Great Britain. This stuff is taught with OBS many places. Okay, they're building cities around them big. Okay, and the idea is cross-docking, okay, changing from one container to another. So at the beginning, it's just containers, but then it's going to be stuff within the containers and so on. So we begin them to see them. Where, so it depends which level you, you are. Uh, I don't see a ton of them. I see within companies, we begin to see them, and, but full scale, okay, not much yet, okay, but, but this kind of, uh, people are, I know many people are thinking very seriously about it, okay, and some of them have deep pockets, so they, if, if they decide to move, they can move very fast. Well, thank you very much, okay? Uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, hopefully it's been a good experience for you. Take care.